I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. This season, we're reaching beyond my own collection of interviews to bring you voices from the Studs Terkel Radio Archive. The archive holds more than 5,000 programs that the pioneering oral historian and broadcast legend recorded for WFMT Radio in Chicago between 1952 and 1997. Studs conducted most of his interviews at his studio in downtown Chicago, but in late 1967, he took his tape recorder to Paris. That's where he interviewed female impersonator John Falk Tompkinson, a 38-year-old Quebec native who performed under the stage name Les Lee. Les, as he was known to his friends, began his career in the late 1940s at the mafia-controlled 181 Club in New York's East Village. It was known at the time as the homosexual Copacabana. In the 50s, he took the stage at legendary venues like Leon and Eddie's in Miami, Finocchio's in San Francisco, and Le Carousel in Paris. But wherever he performed, as an exotic interpretive dancer or as a singer, he was always dressed to perfection in dazzling costumes that he designed and sewed himself. In the 60s, Les starred at Chez Leslie, his very own club on Rue Guissard in Paris's Saint-Germain-des-Prés neighborhood. That's where Studs sat down with him for an interview first broadcast on New Year's Eve, 1967. So let's join Studs Terkel and Les Lee and a room full of raucous patrons as Les, the proud host, begins by sharing a bit of his club's ghoulish history. Actually, the place was called the Guizard before because it was the stable of the Duc de Guizard, and which <laughs> actually this beam, this right above your head, is where he was hung. <laughs> history then, yes. sort of macabre history. Exactly. That's why they, they, the, the, we know that they couldn't pull, pull the building down even if they wanted to because it's a, a, a point of history, and all points of history in Paris are not allowed to be changed. Now you, you yourself are not French. No, I'm not. I'm Montreal boy from uh, Montreal, Canada, and I've been in Paris for seven years now. What led you to Paris? Well, actually, my, my business, I, I'm a female impersonator. I worked in New York, and uh, I was working in Finocchio's in San Francisco at the time. And uh, a manager of one of the big shows here in Paris saw me working and asked me to come to Paris. And <laughs> it amused me, so I, I came and I haven't, I haven't been back since. Well, think of this craft or this art or skill of female impersonation. I remember as a small boy, I saw someone named Julian L. Tinge he years ago. He was the first, ago. actually. He was the first, He was the first in America who ever became a big star. He did uh, silent movies with Gloria Swanson. And well, the, the, the technique, the theme of female impersonation itself... Has, it has changed a great deal, especially in Europe because the female impersonators in Europe, they, they are not like the female impersonators in America, nor of the tact of Julian Elton. So being as a boy in the daytime and a, and a female impersonator impersonating at night, the female impersonator in Europe have gone to the extent of taking female and hormone injections oh, really? and growing their own hair and living as women, which I don't approve of. I don't think they're neither one or the other at that point. Well, I, mean, I didn't realize this, that there is this difference oh, a big between difference. the American female who, oh, a who leaves difference. a split life. Uh, it's not a split life. It's, a, it's like any, any entertainer, actually. I mean, a, a, a clown is a clown at, uh, while he's on the, in the circus and a personality of his own and, in the daytime. He does not clown in real life. As a, now, your tech, now, what is your, your interpretation? You, you, you believe in the American interpretation? Oh, I certainly do. I, I think that's the whole art of being a female impersonator. I mean, there is people who know me and have seen me as a female impersonator who I've passed on the street the day after not knowing me at all. So here, then, is the skill, the art. Yeah, are the particular, we think of female impersonation, we think of many who, who impersonate celebrated figures, actresses, or... Yes. Social. Do you do you have certain no, targets? I, no, I do not. I, I have my own personality, which I, I push forward and, and jokes, and I, I sing in my own natural voice. I don't try to make anything artificial about it. The the art of my work is just looking something different than what I this have. This is the art of illusion, is it exactly. not? Exactly. It's the art of illusion. of illusion. You say you sing in your natural voice, and yeah. yet you are female. So this then, because of illusion, would come through as a contralto, perhaps? No, a tenor, a male tenor voice. Oh, a male tenor voice. A male, a tenor, a male voice. tenor voice, but the illusion of seeing me as a girl, it, 
becomes more effeminate. That's what I mean. It's so your, it's eye, your eyes doing tricks with you. Well, here's the matter of illusion at work. Exactly. So it's a question of being an art and a skill with you rather than a way of life. Exactly. Well, this is the place itself that, of which you're the host, the Shea Leslie, we should point out the food, the menu looks most enticing and neat. Do you have a certain way uh, well, you cho you've chosen? Well, we, we have tried to keep the food somewhat uh, French home cooking because the French cuisine in Paris is very, very highly seasoned and lots of wine and very fancy and very heavy, actually. It's the best cuisine in the world, they say, although myself, I prefer a hamburger and a Coca-Cola. But um, we try to keep it very simple and the, the old homemade bread and something we've tried to keep to go with the atmosphere of the room because it's all in, in old wood and uh, just ordinary flat walls. Back to you again, Leslie. Why, uh, you're a female impersonator. Why did you come to, why Paris? Are there more female impersonators here than there would be in other cities in the world? No, no, I don't think so. But I think that the, the uh, art of female impersonating in Europe is much more highly looked at than in America. It's not regarded as freakish, say, as would be no, in America. Not at all. And Not so this is the sense you feel more, perhaps, uh, more no, accepted. I mean, you're accepted to, an, uh, to a point, if you're an entertainer or an artist, they will look at you and respect you. I have very, very high respect here in Paris because everyone knows me as being a female impersonator. Like, back home, uh, people who know me of being a female impersonator, they sort of shunt their noses and point, yeah. which doesn't make any difference to me because they don't pay my bills and I live my life as long as I don't hurt anyone and I have my family who respect me, that's the most important thing. In short, uh, this is the point, I think this is a rather key point you're raising. Here you're not being pointed at in a rather not derogatory manner. Not at all. And this would be the case back oh, home. Oh, back home, certainly. Because I started in the business in New York at the 181. And believe me, I know what kind of remarks people make in America. Is this what you've always wanted to do when you were a small boy in Montreal? What was your dream when you were a small To be a fashion designer. To be a, oh, to be a fashion designer. <laughs> yes. Well then, uh, what did the idea of fashion designing occur to you? But how old were you? Oh, 17, 18 years old. 17, 18. And I went to, to art school in, in New York and then to America. And the uh, place I was working to went bankrupt. And I was very, very young when I, when I left home. I was 18 years old. And um, nobody would just give me any chance at all because I was so young. And I felt that if someone had given me a chance, I would have become a, a, a big designer. Were you the only child, by the way? No, no, no I'm, the, I'm the youngest of four. You're the youngest of four. Yeah, I came from a farm in Canada. Can you recall when you were very small, what your thoughts were, uh, what you wanted, would you want to be an actor? Was it always? No, not at all. No. If someone told me that I was going to be on the stage, I would have laughed at them. Yeah. Not at all, and there's nothing in the family at all like yeah. that. Nothing, I'm the only person who in the family who is artistic. Not that I want to continue in my work. I hope that one day that I'll get out of it and go back to that little thought of being a designer. Do you have thoughts about designing? I mean, do you have a, a something oh, in your I, mind, a specific thing, say, in, in connection with fashion? I would like uh, to do the eccentric things, but people won't wear them, so there's no sense well, in doing What sort of eccentric things? Oh, eccentric accessories for men and women. I think the, the average person dress for the Mrs. Smith and the Mrs. Jones. If they were just dressed for their own personalities, they'd be much happier. So you're asking We now. do, we do. We dress for Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones. What would she say if I wore this? Or what would she say if I wore that? If we wore exactly what we thought we would feel good in and enjoy wearing colors, and I think people would be much more happy in the world. You're one of four children, is that right? That's You're one right. of four children. The youngest of four. I have two brothers and a sister. Uh, one of your brothers, the older brother's a plumber, right? That's right. The other a machinist. Machinist. And your sister. And my sister housewife. A housewife. With two children. <laughs> I was about to ask, how do your two brothers feel about you? My older brother, as we don't talk about. My, my brother next to me thinks that I'm a very fine entertainer and a very fine person because uh, I live my life correct because of my mother and father. And your mother and father, they seen you at work as a female yes, person. they saw me working in San Francisco. What are their reactions? They drove across Canada for the first time in their lives, which is a wonderful drive, actually. And they, they saw me working on stage. My mother had always seen pictures of me and didn't think very much of it. My father was completely against it until he saw me work. 
And then when he saw me work, he knew that he saw in me the goodness and the, the point of being a good entertainer. And he was very pleased, yeah, <laughs> very <friends>. proud. <laughs> you have friends, you have friends, you told me, who never have told their parents. Never, they would never think of telling their parents that they're female impersonators because in America it's shunned upon. Even though I was in America when I think it wouldn't be shunned upon because my mother and father don't shun on things that their children do. Because it's done in, they, they said, they said to me, we taught you the right and wrong, and if you don't do things right, and the things that are wrong, that's all we can teach you. There's nothing more. They want you to be happy. Oh, they know that I'm happy. I write to her every, my mother and father every week, and they write to me every week. You said uh, you were different. You were different. Yes, completely yeah. different to my brothers and sisters. That's why I, I was very alone as a child, because I was different and until I really found my, my life and found out how I felt in life. I was completely opposite to everything that was done in the family, and therefore I was alone as a child. But now I'm not at all. When, when did you, can you remember this, or is this too difficult? When, when you first to... felt you were different? Oh, no, all my life. All my life, as far as I can remember back. Uh, I know, I, I, this is a difficult one to answer. No, well, it's, it's a different thing. It's a very delicate situation to talk about, but it, the, my, I did things that my brothers didn't enjoy doing. They, as I say, one is a plumber and the other is a machinist. They, they would build things of wood and iron and uh, very hard, constructive things where I would be painting or, or designing, or, which is completely opposite to what they... would work with softer fabrics, softer perhaps fabrics. silk and velvets. Oh, exactly. Yes. And always, at the very beginning, this was your memory. Always, always, always. Oh, I was always very creative. I always, if my mother was giving a party, I was the one who did the table and made the decorations for the house. And if it was anything to paint or to draw or, or posters for the church, it was always, <laughs> always me. <laughs> Did you have early school memories? School? No, I hated school. You hated school? I hated school because Why? I was different from everyone else. I felt different. I don't know whether I was different than everyone else because I didn't know everyone that was at school. Did the other kids, did they uh, oh, pick on you? Yes, because I was a very fine featured. I was when I was a child. And they picked on me, like all, all kids do, pick on everybody. Who is different? Who is different? Who is not like themselves? Who is different, exactly. It's a thing that a lot of people don't understand with, with children. They don't try to understand, which was, as I say, very fortunate. My mother and father did understand me. But there are so many children and so many boys and girls in the world who are so far away from their families and uh, their mother and fathers because of this reason. They don't want to understand. They just think, oh, it can't happen to my child. My child is not different from anyone. But we are. Everyone is different. Everyone in the world is different. Have you ever talked about this with your friends here who also have been with the Do they no, talk about I don't it? Never do, do no, they? No, I have no reason to talk my private life to my friends no, here. They never... Because I don't think never... we have very many friends. People don't have very many friends, really. When you really think how many friends you really have, many really friends, we don't have very many. I know thousands of people in Paris and London and America and Canada, and I think I have four friends. I mean, you, can, you can have lots if you have the money. You can have money, but what, what's money? Money can't buy happiness nor health. Or friends, really. You can buy artificial friends if you want them. I'm a very, very big realist. I see things too clearly, I'm afraid. Which has made me happy because I see exactly what what I have to live with and I've lived with it. When did you find you could make your way? When I left home when I was in, in New York by myself. I left home when I was 18 years old and I went to New York with a scholarship as a dress designer and I lost my job because of the, the, um, the company become bankrupt and I worked in the automats, believe it or not, <laughs> as a boy picking up dishes and then I, bus boy, and then I started working in show business as a skater at the Roxy Theatre. But I, I was alone at home 
but I was alone in, in New York and I, I didn't know anyone, so no one knew me or where I came from, so I felt that I would make my life as I choose and no one would bother me, which they didn't. And that I came right out of my shell. I really did, because I knew that by hiding or by, by trying to be something that I'm not, it would become very artificial. And therefore, I, I, exactly as I am, I talk the way I please, I dress the way I please, and if people accept me, it's because I am what I am, and otherwise they, otherwise they don't, and I don't really care, because to me, they're not people. Because I accept the people that come in here, I don't know what they are, or who they are, or where they are, but they're all very friendly with me. Les closed his Paris club in the late 1960s, but continued to appear on stage for at least another decade. The 70s brought engagements at the Birds of a Feather Drag Review at London's Royalty Theatre, a seven-year stint at a gay club in Cannes, and tours in Asia, Australia, and across continental Europe. His act, a little nice, plenty naughty, included impersonations of Marlena Dietrich, Judy Garland, and Josephine Baker. After that, the digital trail of Les's professional life runs cold. Information about his personal life, beyond what he told Studs, is even tougher to find. But the 1982 autobiography of early British trans advocate April Ashley offers some glimpses. April and Les met in Paris the second half of the 1950s, when they both performed at Le Carousel. April described Les as having, quote, all the old-fashioned vices, but all the old-fashioned virtues, too, noting that he sent money home to his parents every month. For a time, they were roommates. April wrote, I shared a big apartment with him and had hardly any sleep. There were troops of men through the flat all night long while I snuggled up to Fru Fru, his dog, christened after the underskirt of a can-can dancer. John Falk Tonkinson, best known to fans the world over as Leslie, died in Paris on August 13, 2006. He was 76 years old. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History possible. Senior producer Nahani Rouse, co-producer and deputy director Inga Dataya, audio engineer Kevin Seaman, researcher Brian Faree, photo editor Michael Green, genealogist Michael O'Clerk, and our social media team, Christiana Pena, Nick Porter, and Danny Olarenko. Special thanks to Jenna Weiss Berman and our founding editor and producer, Sarah Burningham. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Studios with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives at the USC Libraries. Season 8 of this podcast is produced in association with the Studs Terkel Radio Archive, which is managed by WFMT in partnership with the Chicago History Museum. A very special thank you to Allison Shine Holmes, Director of Media Archives at WTTW Chicago PBS and WFMT Chicago, for giving us access to Studs Terkel's treasure trove of interviews. You can find many of them at studsterkel.wfmt.com. Season 8 of this podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, Proud Chicagoans Barbara Levy Kipper and Erwin and Andrew Press, the Small Change Foundation, and our listeners, including Eric Lee and Joe Cangelosi. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Joe. Stay in touch with Making Gay History by signing up for our newsletter at makinggayhistory.com. Our website is also where you'll find previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people and stories we feature. So long, until next time. <laughs>